we wanted to show the biggest mountains in the world. So the Himalaya was a natural choice for that. Also our name, Sherpa Cinema, is directly related to that area. I mean, how the Himalayas in specific came about is like I met with Renan in Salt Lake City at the Camp 4 office and put forth the idea of a collaboration. It turned out that our Bolivia trip was booked the exact same time. In a game of rock, paper, scissors, um, I got to go to Nepal. Renan spent a, almost a better part of his life living and climbing and experiencing Nepal. Met him in Nepal and next thing you know, he's like speaking fluent Nepali to all the locals. He's showing me all these nooks and crannies in Kathmandu and just blowing my mind. I'd never met Dave before the trip. Both had reputations for breaking a lot of camera gear. I'd heard that he was pretty much willing to do anything to chase after a high concept shot. We called the Nepal trip a vision quest because it didn't involve any skiing. It was the best part about the whole trip is we didn't have to let go and shoot action because that's what we're always doing. Dave is just one of the most creative filmmakers I've ever met. He's really focused on visual metaphors. I suffer from this thing that Crossan calls FOMAS. FOMAS is an acronym that I've developed. Is like, oh, I got FOMO, I didn't go out last night. That's like a fear of missing out, like fear of missing out on a good time is what FOMO is. And FOMAS is just fear of missing a shot. The FOMAS will, will take you on some wild goose chase. My eye is acting like a camera, and everywhere I look, I'm seeing different angles and shots. Whenever I see one of those things, I have to shoot it. My brain's just like, dude, I need to get this shot. It just continues and continues and continues. And I really thought I was alone in this venture until I met Renan, who apparently is even worse than I am. This is gonna be the ultimate time-lapse trip. We're gonna get some amazing clouds and things are gonna be great. We had to go on the cusp of the monsoon season. And when we headed into the mountains, they were completely socked in. We couldn't see anything. So of course, I'm in touch with a lot of our athletes and they're wondering what's going on. And I just throw it out there to Bushy, see if he wants to go to Nepal. Tagging along, I guess. <laughs> For Don, he saw, my, he saw that I was walking barefoot. For me, that's normal. I go barefoot everywhere. Bushfield has had a crazy couple of years. He had just uh, lost his wife who had hit her head in a half pipe accident and severed vertebral artery. Following Sarah's death, Bushy, like all of us, if we lose somebody close to us, has to go through a journey, and that journey is different for everybody. Because I had the same injury, it was really profound to spend that, that time with him there. Thinking about, I don't know, I found myself doing a lot of thinking over there. I was in a place in my life where it was, it was exactly what I needed. You basically became our lifestyle coach, constantly making us laugh and like pulling the craziest antics, just like flipping off of any stone or fence that he could find. Something that tragic could just stop someone in their tracks, but for Bushy, it was like continue onward and, and live every day to the fullest. And it was just super beautiful to watch. Yeah, when we were there, we didn't get a lot of good weather. Oh my God, dude, what happens if we don't see a single mountain while we're here? About a week in, I'm on over this hill. I saw this forest, and I see this old guy walking along, super old guy, and he's got this yak like dragging along the trail. Alone with that, I was that's amazing. And then I see Renan come running up from behind me. He's like, karma, karma. Karma's like, oh, Renan, you know, and they give this like reuniting hug. What ended up happening was that that cloud forced us to focus more on the culture and ended up being a full blessing in disguise. There was no option to feel like we were missing the shot of the mountains and instead we went into the internal world of shooting with karma. Just hang out with him for days on end in his tiny traditional Sherpa home. <laughs> same, same. Same, same. <laughs> Castor, bro. Six, 
I'm Sid. 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 This guy might as well be 150 years old. He lives way up at like however many thousand feet above sea level with his yak. Just burns yak dung. He's rocking this awesome North Face jacket that Renan gave him like five years ago or something. Can't quite explain it. It's just like you're ne you're standing next to somebody who's enlightened or something. His temperament, the way he holds himself, the way he looks at you, the way he serves you tea, everything he's doing is just this just kind of magical thing. I don't know if you've experienced that sort of thing in your life, but it's like when someone has a cool voice and they talk to you and you're sort of neck tingles a little bit, you're just like, wow, this is a cool voice. Getting the chance to hang, hang out with him and meet him and shoot with him is a once in a lifetime opportunity. He opened his doors to us and we were immediately sucked into his world. Eventually I realized that, you know, as I got the camera closer and closer to him, it was just, he was completely unfaceable the camera, you know, like inches away from his face. I was invisible to him. It was all natural light through one soft light source coming in through his window. Try some like down into the slope, into the fire. Ready? Back to the main. Here we go, coming up. Renan and I just like teed off in there. We basically getting the black lung from all this like dung that he was burning with no chimney and he's constantly praying. He has all these spinning devices around him, like a spinny thing to light the fire, a, a giant pillar that spins beside him while he prays, and of course the prayer wheel that's one of the centerpieces of Into the Mind. Even while we were there, we started realizing that this guy was gonna be a really big part of our movie. As a concept, karma hearing represents the force of nature. I eventually started thinking of karma as the earth, like as if I was shooting the landscape of planet earth just in this little shack in Nepal. Here at the Sherpas, we're sort of obsessed with visual similarities, like the creases in his forehead or in his knuckles and his hands. They look like the folds of crevasses pouring over the edge of a mountain. You know, maybe his white beard, it looks like a spine wall in Bella Coola. If earth had a character, this is sort of what it would exude. I think there's some like connection there or some repeating pattern, some almost mathematical like algorithm that is repeating in nature and, and is telling us something about the true nature of the universe and life and existence and, and who we are. swing arms and raining, you see the water cycle going along and then it crescendos into the big shot of Amada Blam, which is sort of like the symbol of the challenge. which is all very heavy and like intense and godlike. And then by the end of the movie, he's climbing onto his roof to like look outside. What we're realizing is that karma is actually just this old man. He's a human just like you and me. Yeah, the photos at the end just show that karma Searing's able to look back on his life. He's looking back on a life in the mountains, which is the ultimate goal for some people. Um, I guess he becomes a lot more human in that last scene except he's enlightened. He's lived this beautiful, full life, and that's our goal as well. And someday we could be as cool as Karma Siri. If you've seen our movies, you know that it's not just like pretty pictures or whatever. There's symbols, there's like meaning. We hope, that's what we try for. A good, easy example that's from Into the Mind is the birds. And then of course, the raven is a very powerful bird for people who live and spend a lot of time in the mountains spiritual role, especially those who've lost uh, friends and mentors in the mountains. I had some spiritual moments for sure there, like delirious moments, like gnarly dreams, like awesome dreams while I was there. And then some solo hikes while you guys were hunkered down in Karma's lair. I went out and uh, 
spread some of Sarah's ashes in the mountains. It was an awesome thing to do. It's pretty common folklore around here, at least in Whistler, that you know, those are the old shredders of the past and uh, they're looking over us as we go skiing in the mountains. The first time that the sun actually came out was when we were higher up. We had set up a puja ceremony in the Pengboshe Gompa, which is the oldest monastery in Nepal. Renan and I went in there and the Lama was giving us a prayer. And all of a sudden, we turn around, there is like the most beautiful beam of light I've ever seen in my life coming down in perfect symmetry into the center of this like magic room. The awnings on the top of the monastery were also blowing in the wind and splintering the light into different beams. We hadn't seen sun in like two weeks. It's just the most amazing display of natural light. It almost looks fake. It was like faux moss like never before. We just like basically somersaulted across the room. Usually with faux moss, as soon as you get your camera in focus, like the light beam just disappears and it's gone. What? But it wasn't until we got back to the edit bay that we realized the sort of potential narrative of these shots. Our protagonist goes through a very tough time and suffers an incredibly bad accident. I remember like sitting there editing and being like, okay, now I'm gonna make like the death segment. To me, the urn, the smoking urn represents the spirit of the protagonist. Sitting in the light, the monks are the messengers basically that'll carry him and the masks are kind of judging and deciding what, what they're gonna do about it because he's really, really close to death. And in the end, the monks decide to rekindle the fire, you know? So fire in our film is a big symbol. It happens when you're really raging, when you're living life to the fullest, like skiing in Bella Coola. It's suffering really hard when you're climbing in Bolivia. That means your energy is there and like, it's almost a philosophy of why humans have to suffer this segment. The urn starts to get rekindled, the fire starts to get rebuilt. Karma is building up his fire, the monks are building up the fire uh, until it's finally ignited. And that's when you see Kai and these guys in Bolivia just suffering. So that Bolivia segment was really supposed to symbolize uh, this climb out of hell, like going to the very bottom place that you can possibly go in life and climbing your way back out of that. And it takes a lot of fire in the heart to do that. And from there in, we saw lots of beams of light. After that, the mountains came out. The higher we went, hiking along out there, it, it was a crazy world to spend up at 18,000 feet or whatever. We, you know, my brain works at sea level with sea level oxygen. When you take that away, like my brain did different things up there for sure. Tennis player, hockey player, football player, I can like, I can't do it, but I could see how you could do that. Porters in Nepal, I'm just like, looking at them being like that, what you're doing right now is not possible. Ridiculous feats of humanity, like 100 kilo loads on their back and they're like passing me up the gnarliest trail on the side of a crazy cliff with like, it's just ridiculous. You know, the best part of all of these trips that I get to go on in the making of these films is the people that I meet along the way. After meeting Renan, the movie really took its form based on Renan's true story. Actually, Renan himself came really, really close to dying in this crazy ski accident and then came back after that to climb one of the craziest routes in the world. So his story actually became entrenched in the film and really the story of the protagonist is basically the story of Renan. Confront death right in the face and then miraculously have the chance to be reborn and try again. And you actually see some of that real footage of Renan in Into the Mind when he's being whisked away to the, to the hospital. So up at our high camp, which was about 19,000 feet or so, at Porter's had brought us 
the cranes, the epic camera, they brought us all this canvas and paint and all this stuff. So we got the chance to shoot these really high production value shots. Shooting Renan as he paints this beautiful mural. He's really a artist, like a true artist from his soul. And I suppose our trip, it's just like this artistic inquisition, just going into this world, which really turned out being more like going into the mind. And the light was good, and we're like, oh my god, these are the coolest mountains. So Renan's just teeing off, like pulling out every piece of Kessler equipment he can find, and like setting up these crazy dollying, panning, moving time lapses. There's literally like six or seven cameras all clicking away, running time lapses. One thing that I really was looking for was a cave to come out of, like some sort of hole where the camera could sort of emerge into this massive mountain range, supposedly going into the mine. What do we got here? We've run out of tripods or support. We've got rocks precariously stacked on every brace point. And Renan spent hours fiddling and tinkering with this thing until it was actually worthy of setting a camera on top of. And when it was all said and done, Dave was trapped behind the setup in the back of the cave. I'm currently locked into this cave because the tripod blocks the way out. <laughs> it was like a ridiculous situation where I was just sort of stuck in this tiny little hole thinking. It's the highest that I've ever been off the surface of the ocean and it really makes you feel weird. Oh, well, it's turned out to be quite a shot. He had to go into his mind because he was just there was nowhere he could go. And Renan dubbed it the end of the mine time-lapse. Strangely enough, that's exactly what it became in the film. It, it was uh, the perfect place for us to put the title, Into the Mine. Foam ass does pay off. The fact that we were both stubbornly chasing after every little moment. Pays off in probably some of the best shots in the high movies. It's another word for working super hard. Cruise around in those mountains with good friends, and it was a, it was a life changer for sure. I take a lot from, from my time over there. Though we certainly didn't capture everything, we probably get about two or three percent of the shots that we tried, but those two or three percent that worked out are, are really, really special. And we're incredibly fortunate to have the chance to get them.